Gender is probably the most universal source of inequality or feature of inequality when it's associated with female gender. Um, Gender-based inequality cuts across race and class, ethnicity and age. It's almost completely universal in the sense that being a woman or a girl comes with structural disadvantages almost everywhere. And um, if I could simply make a comparison, there is no other social group which represents 50% of any population that is systematically subordinated to the other half of the population, including sexual subordination. This happens to no other group according to race or age or ethnicity or class. Women's subordination is, is very, very complex because it's both a matter of class subordination in the sense of economic subordination, but also a attitudinal or evaluational subordination and differentiation. One of the most interesting recent contributions to our understanding of gender and inequality is a, a set of studies by Mala Tun and Laurel Weldon in the US, which is based on extensive cross-national data on women's empowerment and status and very specifically violence against women. And what they find is across countries, across political systems, across income levels, the most significant factor in reducing the sharpest edge of women's disprivilege, which is violence and their subordination and subjection to violence from men, the most significant factor in reducing this or, or fixing this is the size and strength and autonomy of the women's movement. That is more significant than type of political regime, than national wealth, or even than um, prevalence of certain religions or culture, cultural patterns. Um, another study by Valerie Hudson and a set of uh, statisticians likewise looked at or took that one step further. It looked at the um, extent to which countries are um, uh, amenable or have a propensity to engage in conflict, in violent conflict internally or externally. And it found that the strongest predictor of national propensity to engage in war and armed conflict, strongest predictor is levels of violence against women. So that is more powerful as a predictor of national propensities to engage in armed conflict than is democracy, national wealth, or the prevalence of Islam was another um, specific indicator that they looked at. So the size and strength and autonomy of women's associations and organizations is extremely important for women's empowerment and also a serious challenge to support effectively. For instance, how do you support women's organizations in conflict contexts when they're hard to reach, uh, not very accessible via communication technology, don't have bank accounts, aren't well established as organizations? Um, there are very serious and significant obstacles to supporting women's um, organizations. As we know, given the complexity of women's empowerment, um, the MDGs um, really was shooting under the bar when it was just measuring girls' education as an indicator of women's empowerment, with the other two indicators interesting, but not enough being women's employment and women in political decision making. So the post-2015 sustainable development goals have, of course, gone far beyond the MDG framework um, from a gender perspective. And on the whole, um, at this point, which is March 2015, these um, goals and targets look good. As we know, there's nine targets under goal five on gender. And overall, we see gender coming up across many, many other goal areas. I think there's about 25 uh, targets in those areas that are gender specific. So that's quite extraordinary. Now, leave aside discussion about the feasibility of this framework just yet, because obviously there's too much in it. But I just wanted to stress that what's good to see in the framework are the things, some of the most egregious exclusions from the MDGs. And those are, from a gender perspective, one, it addresses unpaid labor, which is an enormously significant constraint. 
on women's capacity to profit from their own labors. Vast unpaid labor um, obligations. Second, it mentions, of course, violence against women in a few places. Um, so this is also particularly valuable and important. So we're very pleased, I'm very pleased to see this in the framework. At the same time, of course, there are some things missing. The language on sexual and reproductive rights is cagey and could be much stronger because women's control of their own sexuality is key to being able to challenge some of the core status constraints on women when they're challenging their status vis-a-vis -vis men. Uh, so that's missing. Also missing is any mention or measure of women's collective action. Given what I've said regarding the crucial value of women's autonomous collective action in advancing and, and building accountability for women's rights, the absence of any mention of the need to facilitate and support and grow women's collective action is unfortunate. There's also no mention of um, increasing the presence and influence of women in local government. Um, it's alluded to indirectly, uh, but, but local government is a crucial arena for women to advance their goals. And in some countries, this has not moved much at all without the use of quotas at a local government level. We still see very, very male-dominated local decision-making, which is often where patriarchy is at its most intense and where uh, patriarchal and class and other status relationships are, are crushing. So it would have been nice to see that appear more strongly in the um, post-2015 framework. And of course, it's in the implementation that we can continue to argue for those goals. The reason it's really useful to distinguish between status and class policies and between doctrinal and non-doctrinal policies is it's useful to understand the type of opposition and resistance that gender and development policies trigger. Political environments will shape that opposition. So obviously it's easier to pursue gender equality policies, whether doctrinal or non-doctrinal status or class in democracies with transparency and accountability. That, that goes without saying. Likewise, where women's organizations are strong, these things are easier to pursue. By status policies, what Tun and Weldon are doing is they're getting at this difficult quality of the um, ideological or the um, cultural value assigned to women and men. So they're getting at policies that challenge male dominance and power but that is a dominance in power that may not have anything to do with wealth or class. So status policies are things like abortion rights, um, divorce rights within family law, the right to postpone marriage and not marry as a child, the right to control fertility completely. Those kinds of policies affect men's status and in the gender hierarchy. That's different from class policies. Class policies seek to raise women's income, um, women's access and control of property, um, women's access to public services. Those policies don't necessarily cha challenge male sexual dominance or male dominance in um, certain other aspects of gender relations, but they improve women's class status. So status policies, and class policies. That's an initial distinction. Then overlaying that distinction, Tun and Weldon propose that we think about doctrinal and non-doctrinal policies. In other words, gender policies that challenge religious doctrine or custom will arouse much more significant opposition than gender policies that challenge only class issues. There are other kinds of gender status policies that are not as um, perceived to be as challenging doctrinally. Those are things like um, gender quotas in elections. That challenges the male prerogative on public power, but it doesn't necessarily challenge a doctrinal um, issue. It is not uh, something that's sort of held onto in any religious framework. So this is a four-part distinction. Um, status policies that are both doctrinal and non-doctrinal, class policies that are both doctrinal and non-doctrinal. 
Um, a very important status policy that is not doctrinal is stopping violence against women. Stopping violence against women actually is something that can be pursued even in pretty conservative contexts because there is actually no religion that formally defends extreme violence against women or violence against women. There, there actually isn't. So um, it is possible to pursue violence against women policies pretty much anywhere. And that is actually why it is often the very first and most important type of gender policy that women's groups pursue. Advancing women's rights in developing country context is a political project. You cannot legislate away a power imbalance. And what we're talking about is a profound power imbalance, which will not disappear with laws and with policy changes. It will only in the end disappear with an interest group demanding accountability. And that's why support for women's organizations is crucial to any work on gender and development. external donor support to women's organizations is often perceived as unwanted Western interference with local culture. We know that less than 1% of post-conflict spending goes to support women's organizations, much less than 1%. So it's a huge exaggeration to say that this is a evidence of Western interference and Western meddling with culture. Nevertheless, it is something that is very important to try to find a way to do that is not seen as imposing external perspectives. And this is why things like global funds, such as the Urgent Action Fund or the Global Fund for Women are valuable because these are independent funds to which women's organizations can apply for support. There is another type of fund which has been um, initially very promising, which is the Dutch fund called Women on the Front Lines. This is a fund intended only to support the organizational capacity building of women's groups in the Middle East and Arab states. What, the way it works is it's done in partnership with PricewaterhouseCooper and it's intended solely to enable women's organizations to establish financial management capability. So the money is very little and it's used to hire an accountant and get a computer and get accounts in order. After one year, the organization applies uh, goes through an audit with PricewaterhouseCooper and as you know getting through that audit is almost like a ticket to then being able to apply for external funding. So that kind of support which is non-programmatic, which is not predetermining activities but is intended for the sole purpose of strengthening the institutional capabilities of women's organizations, that is something that requires I think further attention in supporting women's empowerment.